everyone. My name is Padmini Nidamolo, and I'm the co-founder of Lean and Agile for Women, a platform that brings women across the world together to share, and offer, and seek from each other, and also celebrate the journeys of fantastic women that we have around us. And this is a fantastic community. Agile community is, is, is a very collaborative community. And I think we all benefit from bringing stories and journeys, and most importantly, challenges that these women had to face. But um, the lesson that we will take away is how did they persist? How did they overcome the challenges? And um, arrive at where they are. I think that's the uh, crux of these interviews. And uh, that's the hope that, you know, if, if at least one of you is inspired by these conversations, this effort is very worth it. So with that, today on, on this uh, episode, we have Ronica Roth from Colorado. Hi, Ronica. Hello. Thank you for your time. My pleasure. Uh, I'll say a few words about you, Ronica, as a very brief introduction, and then we can get into the conversation, okay? So uh, sure. a few words about Ronica. I had the pleasure of meeting with Ronica and, and having a chat with her in the context of learning more about Jean Tobaker uh, in 2020, uh, sometime in, in June timeframe. And since then I've been wanting to bring her on this platform and, and have her share her journey. Um, in 2019, Ronica co-founded Elevate.to which partners with organizations to deliver lasting, positive, agile, transformative changes. Elevate is a majority women-owned enterprise. Since around 2000, Ronica has been leveraging agile and lean principles and practices to help organizations change the way they work and the way we work together. She speaks and mm -hmm. writes regularly on business agility and organizational change. And in addition to business, other team sports she enjoys, such as uh, softball, rugby, and hockey, which is incredible, Ronica, by the way. And she also likes <laughs> to hike, bike, and ski the Rockies. That should keep you very busy. I don't know when you have time for business agility or coaching, honestly. That's a full-time job right there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, I don't, I don't actually play the rugby and the hockey anymore, so uh, that 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 saves some time. <laughs> but it's it's great to know that you you keep yourself very active and moving. That's mm -hmm. that in itself is what we need in this pandemic where we are restricted to go outside. Yes. <laughs> so um, tell us a little bit about what brought you into agile, Tonika. How did this journey even begin for you? Mm. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, it's funny, uh, I, IT itself was a second career for me. I was uh, a, a journalist first um, for about the first 10 years of my career. Wow. And um, yeah, and uh, at some point um, <laughs> I got tired of being broke all the time <laughs> and I had a, a a newspaper that wasn't quite paying the bill often and found that a tech to, I, I had done some temporary tech work kind of data entry whatever and I went back to those people and I was like hey do you guys, do you guys think I could sell myself as a tech writer and they were all like yeah totally you could totally do that <laughs> um, and so and so that was my entree into the tech world um, uh, in my late 20s, uh, doing some tech, I was kind of doing both for a while, tech writing and running a paper. Um, and then and then at some point, I landed myself in a startup where they started doing um, kind of JAD, joint application development, if you guys remember that. And so yes. it was this radical idea that, you know, you would bring together the tech and the and the business people in a room to actually communicate about like what we were building and what it should do um, and those were pretty large sessions and so they were highly facilitated um, and there was a role for this scribe right so yeah. the, as a tech writer i became the scribe in the in the jad session and so i'd be know how broken that those communication paths were um, but I was here I was sort of helping bridge and then it turns out 
So as the scribe, I also got the JAD facilitation training and the, the business analysts were the facilitators. And um, it's been long enough ago that I can say some of those people that were in my team, they, they weren't great facilitators. And so I did a lot of guerrilla facilitation, um, trying to help. You know, basically, since I was a child, when I see two people failing to communicate, um, it hurts me and I have to fix it. I have to help communicate. So, um, and so that's kind of, the, that was so facilitation. You know, and you mentioned Jean, of course, who became my mentor later when I got really serious about Agile. Um, but that startup, that company, and then they went on to do like the the, the follow up from the big JAD sessions or these little JAD sessions. And, and so we, we didn't figure out iterative and incremental very well, but we got really good at, you know, much higher bandwidth communication between tech and IT. And, and then to be a sweet spot for me. So not just facilitation, but that communication piece as a former journalist and reporter. Um, I, I, so that, so, so I just got really good at that. And so I, I went from tech writer to, to business analyst and requirements analyst. And um, again, doing elements of agile, like we were sort of iterative, sort of incremental, very much about communication. Um, and and I loved it. I just I you know so yeah that's how I got into it. I fell into it. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, and and um and I'm really fascinated by your JAD session facilitation because I remember those sessions you know way in the past and they were they were harsh. They were cruel. Um, you know I've seen fist yeah. fighting in those sessions. So mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I can only imagine yep. more power to you. Uh, you know, I didn't have the guts to facilitate back then, uh, you know, 20 years ago. <laughs> now I do. Yeah. Now I know. Yeah, know. right. <laughs> but um, very yep. interesting. Thanks for sharing that, that background. And, um, you know, uh, very interestingly, a lot of people that I interview, uh, you know, shared the same, right? I fell into it. It just happened to me. I think if it's meant to be, it just happens, right? Um, so that's, yeah. that's really interesting. Yeah. Cool. Well, and then and then at some point there's a shift, right? So on, on on some level you fall into it. So I fell into IT in the first place. Yeah. Um, but and but here's the thing is I I um and I like to tell I like to share this with women in particular because I I I think you know there's the old uh, thing that says you know if if a woman's if there's 10 qualifications for a job and, and, a, and a woman's got eight of them, she, she feels mm -hmm. unqualified. If a guy's got like five, he's like, I'm in. Yes. Right. And, yes. and one of the ways that I combat that in myself is I, when I look back, even though I can say, yes, I fell into it and I have a master's in journalism and no degree related to te technology at all. Um, but I can tell a coherent, I can look back and tell a coherent story around how each thing I did led to what was the next thing and, and equipped me for what was next, right? And so on the one hand, I say, oh, well, I never expected to go into technology, but I did I, at one point in my writing career, I, I wrote about um, met medical research. And so I, I wrote about medical research for a lay audience. I, I wrote about medical research for a very, you know, varied audience. So, and I did a bunch of things like that. I, I wrote about um, uh, pharm pharmacy, uh, uh, the drug research, right? And so I learned how to take very complicated um, and complex topics and translate them for a lay audience. Well, that absolutely set me up to be a great requirements analyst, um, you know, and so, you know, could I have predicted that I plan this journey? No, but I can always look back and kind of find the thread that tells the story. And I think the more we learn to do that, the more we set ourselves up to, to acknowledge what we bring, right? Right. And what makes us successful. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. no, absolutely. I, I think it happens in, in various capacities for all of us. But um, I'm glad it all worked out for you, right? Right from a writer, <laughs> technical writer to um, facilitator to whatnot. Yeah. Uh, very yeah. good for you. You know, I, I wanted to chat about um, 
your, uh, you know, something that you that you founded, the Elevate, right? You know, it's, it's a woman mm-hmm. enterprise. And tell us a little bit about that. The, the reason I'm interested in kind of having that conversation is it takes a lot for civil women to kind of go outside their bubble, their comfort zone and establish something new, you know, um, mm-hmm. because you're creating something new. There's a lot of ambiguity. There's a lot of apprehension. It's always safe to kind of work for someone else because, you know, it feels <laughs> like somebody else is taking care of your paychecks and whatnot. But, yes. but then you have to really create something. And by the way, uh, the IWG International Women's Day theme this year is courage to create right? You know, how mm. we create as women. And I see a lot of apprehension. And I have that apprehension myself before I created. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about, first of all, what does Elevate do? And what mm. brought you to, to create this? Mm. Uh, I'm going to do it in the other order, if that's okay. What, <laughs> what brought me to Good create order. it? Honestly, Honestly, I was I was pushed a little bit by circumstance. So, uh, and, and so there's definitely an element of courage. So, you know, I was um, I was at Rally Software for 12 years altogether, counting counting the the last three years when CA had bought us and it became CA. But, but you know, I I'd been there, and I, you know, in that long time, I reinvented myself and grew and changed and had different roles. And I went from, you know, agile coach to transformation consultant to kind of product manager for services to, um, you know, some a further strategic role in the professional services area. And, um, and then, and then had, you know, and then when CA bought us, there was a whole, that was a really, as, as sad as I was when it first occurred, it was an incredible leadership journey for me to just grow as a leader, um, to to guide this, you know, tribe of agile coaches that I was so passionate about, and sort of help them um, find uh, opportunity and inspiration uh, from being part of a larger organization. And and um, so that was an incredible journey. And I was probably reaching a point where I'm like. Uh, now I've kind of been in the job I've been in for a while. It was time to start thinking about what might be next, which was definitely scary for me, having been in one place for so long where I was in some ways the uh, a face of the brand and and such a part of my identity. And then when they announced Broadcom was going to buy us, um, it, it took a while, but it became clear there wasn't going to be a, a good role for me anyway. So I was like, well, what am I going to do next? And before I could even really think about it, I got this invitation to start Elevate, right? So, or, or start something. We didn't know it would be called Elevate yet. But Christine Hudson had been, we'd been office mates for four years, I think, four or five years. Yeah. Um, we'd, we'd been on the same team for a while. And then and at some point we changed teams. She went to uh, lead the CA internal transformation. I continued uh, leading the coaching organization, but we continued to share an office, right? So, um, you know, so here's someone who's one of my favorite co-creators. I mean, so, I mean, I, I tend to work better in pairing and, and in groups. I don't work well alone, to be honest. Um, and Christine was an incredible pair for me. Um, and so we already loved, we just co-created really well. We were really great thinking partners. And and I remember, this is actually even before Broadcom uh, was going to buy us, because I can picture I was on my porch at home. I was working from home that day in April. It was April. I remember that for some reason, spring day. And Christine's like, let me paint a picture <laughs> of what our, a future, a possible future could be. And what if we start this entity with some of our favorite people to work with? And, and uh, one of those was Eric Willicke, who became who became one of our partners. And there were a couple other people we were trying to re- recruit as well. Um, and it was, you know, imagine this, you know, imagine he- here's my idea of a great month where two weeks out of the month, we're billable with clients doing amazing work that we love having an impact. Um, you know, taking everything we've learned over the last however many years and being able to apply that. And then 
And then sometimes that work is we're pairing as we do it, we're doing it together. Um, and then one week a month, we're collaborating like together and with others of our favorite people and like building new IP and like figuring out where Agile's going next and, and you know, just whatever that looks like. Um, and then one week a month, we're on vacation. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, that sounds amazing. Let's do that. No, I was actually terrified by the, I was, um, I mean, I was like, that sounds amazing. And I'm worried. Like I actually hadn't been a full-time consultant for years. I'd been an internal leader at Rally who occasionally went and talked to, you know, dropped in at our clients to like help them get unstuck or, or, you know, support our transformation consultants. Um, and now this was going to be, and I'd had, I'd had a, a steady income. Um, it was just, yeah, it was terrifying. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I, and, and I was nervous. I was nervous about, you know, I was nervous about income and I was like, well, what, what's, what's this really going to look like? And, um, I don't know. It was kind of like, uh, on, so to answer the real question, which is like, how did I get over that fear piece? So one, it was one of my favorite part, you know, co-creation partners. Eric yeah. also was, was a, a dear friend and colleague from Rally. We'd spent, you know, many, many hours together building stuff and, and working together. Um, and, um, and I knew that uh, um, one of the things I learned in my, in, when I was a, a, an editor at a newspaper, my publisher was amazing and she's the one who first taught me i was was probably in my late 20s and she taught me um the key to success is to build a team that collectively you have all the skills and you need I, you know and she was like as publisher i don't need to be good at all the things i need to hire the people who are good at the things i'm not as good at right, right. and and we used to talk all the time about you know what she brought and what i brought and all that and so that's kind of how i looked at this i was like Eric and Christine, the, the business part, I, I was like, I helped with Riley strategy, but I wasn't responsible at the end of the day for the bottom line. And that, so that made me nervous, but I knew that Eric and Christine knew a lot about how to run a business, run a business, a small business, because they'd done it. Um, you know, I knew, I, so I, I just kept looking at how do we balance each other out? What are we each good at? What are we not good at? Um, we talked about together, what do we, what do we worry about? If we're the leadership team, what is, what, what should we be worried about? And do we, we talked about those things. Um, you know, our logo is an elephant because we love to help companies bring, you know, leaders bring the elephant into the room <laughs> and like from day one, yeah. From day one, that, there are several several reasons for the elephant. That's one of them. <laughs> and from day one, we've been good as a leadership team at at bringing in the elephants and talking about them. And um, and so so these are the things. And so and, and we we had similar ideas about culture, and we try to apply them to ourselves. So how do we create good working agreements? How do we rumble with vulnerability when when we're having emotions or challenges? Um, so that faith in the leadership team, um, in us as a leadership team allowed me to do it. And, and, oh, and the part where Eric had been on his own already for a year or two, and he'd sort of proven that we could make money, <laughs> you know, he's like, look, I've, I, I sold contracts and here's, here's how much I made and here's how it's going. And, you know, we have a client base to build off of. And, um, and then, and then I, the, the last piece that helped me pull the trigger was I have a really good uh, lifelong friend who used to say, you know, at, at every decision you make, every time you're at a crossroads, you make a decision. And if it's the wrong decision, well, you get to make it again. <laughs> if six months from, you know, the beginning, I find out this isn't working, I'm not comfortable, I'm not happy, I'm not making enough money, I can go get a job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I think you, you, know. you hit it on, on the head, right? Um, I really love the message that you, I think, implicitly embedded in your in your answer, uh, Ronika, which is if you're apprehensive to start it alone, find partners, right? You know, there is so much value in co-creating yeah. something. That's number one that I took away. And the other aspect is mm -hmm. 
if it doesn't work, that's fine. It's like an experiment. It's like an experiment. It's like a pilot, right? You know, you would you would go to your you know backup plan or a plan B, or yeah. you know, you'll figure something out. Right. But because if you don't do it at all, you would never know what that was worth. Yeah, you know what they say, right? You you. Um, that's the, that's my hockey background, but um, yeah, and and the. One of the things that helped too was, you know, right right before I left CA, um, Rally CA, I I got a job, you know, I got an offer, an unsolicited offer. Like, hey, Veronica, I hear you're about to become available. Here's here's an opportunity, and it's not even that I spent a ton of time assessing, like comparing. I was just like, oh, right, when it's time to get a job, that won't be that hard. <laughs> it's like I know people, it's going to be fine. Um, yeah. so yeah, at the, and, and partners, the part, the other piece of that partners thing is, um, is that I know myself, I know myself really well. I don't do well alone. I need partners. Like I, I'm not, I don't tend to be motivated alone. I don't have a ton of self-discipline. I need to be part of something bigger than myself. And so that is really about walking in with self-knowledge, right? So really just knowing what I need to feel secure, to feel inspired, to feel successful, and and continuously checking in on that, and then and then now with my partners, always having that conversation, right? As times change and things change, continuing to check in with what do I need to feel secure, inspired, happy? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And and uh, you know one of the other things that I heard from um, you know another interviewee is. We take ourselves way too seriously. You don't have to. If you fail, it's okay. The whole world will not come to its knees. Don't take yourself seriously. Right. I love that response as well. But yeah, I mean no, that, that's very valuable, uh, Veronica. Um, you yeah. know, and then often I think we overlook these, um, you know, little pieces of wisdom. Um, you know, pivoting from that, you know, uh, can you share mm -hmm. some of the challenges that you you have faced in you know your journey with Elevate, and in your uh, interaction yeah. with the organizations, I'm sure it was not a bit of illness, right? You know, <laughs> quite a few challenges. Uh, and, and where oh, yeah. you kind of understand is, you know, what kept you going? What is the belief that kept you going through those challenges? I think that'll be very valuable. Mm. Okay, yeah, um, uh, yes. Um, a couple things come to mind real quick. Uh, one is um, that transition from Rally to, to Elevate was sort of harder than than I maybe expected. And and what that looked like was I, I went through a bit of a mourning period, really, for sort of the end of something I'd loved, helped build and loved. And um, and it's not like, oh, I, you know, it was time for me to move on and that organization still exists. Like the organization doesn't really still exist, right? And so, so there was this morning period and I didn't quite recognize that. And the way, the way it played out was six months, nine months into Elevate. I mean, I was present, I participated and I, you know, I did client work and uh, all the things, but, but I had this realization at some point that like I was pulling my weight. I, I, fully present I wasn't fully engaged and certain conversations in particular like the business like the very money conversations I would tune out a little bit and I, I wouldn't really do my part to make decisions I mean I, again I did but not really like very my my go-to when I'm stressed or uncertain is is a passivity um and so uh and and so what was weird was when I finally noticed it and I was like Oh, I have not been doing my part, you know. I and I kind of, so you know elephants, right? I went to my co-founders and I was like, guys, I'm so sorry. I'm not really. I haven't been doing it. Um, and they and and I noticed it because I kind of woke up, like I came out of the morning period and and kind of got. I forget what sparked it. Something got me excited, and I was like, oh, I haven't been excited. I haven't. Okay, great. I'm so sorry. And they were kind of like, it's okay, welcome. We've been waiting for you to show up fully, you know. <laughs> um, and then and then the challenge of that was I I had to kind of 
I could sit there and, and beat myself up for not being a great partner, or I could figure out, you know, I could just move forward from there. And, and so the moving forward was, okay, great. I got excited. Now, what do I need to do to be fully present? And, and, um, I hadn't been doing a ton of client work. And so it was, a uh, and I hadn't been doing my part in finding more client work. Eric, Eric was sourcing, like everyone, Eric and Christine were sourcing a lot of the work. So, um, I made a commitment to my, and, and asked for help at the same time. I was like, okay, great. Now that I'm awake, <laughs> um, I think I need to do more client work. I think I need to ground in client work. I'm, I'm kind of working on, I thought, you know, thinking stuff, but it's, I'm all over the place and let me ground. And so I want to get more client work and I'm asking for your help to do it. Right? So like, I'm going to, I'm going to do my part to try to make that happen, but I'm also asking for help. And so, um, so that was really powerful and it worked. Uh, I got more client work and that, that reminded me why I do this, right? I do this to make an impact at organizations. And so, and I do this because I like working with people and helping people work together better, mm -hmm. you know, or, and so getting back into that was really helpful. Um, I had another challenge in mind that I've lost. Well, then there's the challenge of um, a little bit of pandemic, of course, we've all just yeah. been through a challenge. Yeah. Um, um, as Elevate reacted to the pandemic, part of it was we had plans to sort of expand and grow and take on more coaches. And, um, instead, we, we shrank a little bit and became a little bit more like a collective of individuals rather than a, than a, a business. Uh, we kind of moved towards a thought leader practice model in which um, we kind of each uh, had our areas that we were pursuing. Um, and that was hard for me because that felt very separate. I don't like the separate. I see previous comments about I don't work well alone. Yeah. Um, um, but, and, uh, going back to knowing myself, um, it, like so much to the pandemic, it, ultimately that led to a lot of great self-reflection and thinking about what I really cared about and what I want to pursue. And um, and now as we as we prepare to emerge out of that whole time, um, you know, I, I love it because we're getting really creative. And so, so one of the things that came out of that time uh, is is rather than be more separate, Christine and I are again, co-creating and pairing. And so like, we've decided to work on a, on a, both a practice and a book um, called Practice Makes Culture. Um, that's all about sort of leveraging facilitative leadership and the power of habit um, to help not only individuals, but groups and organizations um, uh, pursue uh, agile culture together, right? A more facilitate. And so, now, so now we've got this thing that we're working on and we're pairing on and that feels great. And I'm like, I don't want us to all be separate. So we've been talking, you know, Eric's been doing, pursuing some really great work around, around purposeful portfolios and soulful safe. And now we're figuring out how to bring it all together and how do we bring it all together? And we've got uh, more partners that we're working with more closely who really want to kind of build our transformation consulting practice. And, and so we're, and, and this is that part of, for me, again, knowing what, who I am and what I need, leaning in a little bit harder to say, guys, having our, our separate areas of expertise is great. And I want us to continue to work on the collective. What is the whole, what's the, what's the thing, what's the stuff that makes um, the whole greater than the sum of the parts for Elevate? Yeah. And, and in terms of the impact we can have on our clients, right? And how do we get to better business results and happier humans by bringing together everything we're doing? And yeah. so, and, and to, I, I want to come back to, you, you know, you learn more from challenges than successes, right? Yes. I, I just told the success part of that, but, you know, to be really clear, there was an uncomfortable middle bit where I'm like, I don't know if what we're creating is what I want. And, and I don't know if this is making me happy and joyful. And oh, by the way, it's a pandemic. So I don't know what's making me you know, being joyful <laughs> sometimes very up and down. So it's it ultimately it's sitting in those moments and it's a combination of like centering. If I'm centered, then I, then I can know my own heart and whether I feel 
Am I doing what I want to do? Am I getting what I need? Am I inspired so that I can have an impact? And then reaching out to my partners, sometimes without an answer. Like, I don't have an answer. I just have a complaint. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> let's keep yeah. having the conversations to figure out what, how we want to go forward. Yeah. And, and again, I love my partners because we're really good at that. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, that makes a lot of sense, right? Um, I, I think there's always the apprehension that, am I creating the right one? Am I creating the one that I can stick to for a long time? And I, I don't think any of us will have answers straightforward right up front. I think it's a lot of experimentation and a lot of analysis and reflection. So. Absolutely. Completely resilient. Absolutely. So, so, and it's conversations and like, sometimes I think by writing and so, you know, half the time my blog posts are an attempt for me to either sometimes share something I've learned, but often it's, it's my process for like, how engaged am I in what I'm doing? Well, let's see if I can blog about it. That'll show me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's one of my tools, right? <laughs> so again, being really aware, what are the tools that help me process through yeah. um, in a productive manner? Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, this is wonderful. In fact, as we wrap up, Ronika, is there a yeah. short message that you would like to give to our audience of, you know, a short phrase or a sentence or a word that can inspire us? Mm. Something that you live by. Yeah, something I live by. Um, uh, it's going to take me a second to get to the short phrase. I, I just wrote a blog uh, recently about, about fixed, fixed versus growth mindset and, wow. and imposter syndrome. And I'm, I'm battling the, the, the old habits of fixed mindset. Um, and one of the ways I've been doing that is changing my language. So Christine is also my accountability buddy when I'm trying to work towards more of a growth mindset and growth language. And, you know, so when I was young, I, I, I can, and still, I can get stuck in a I can't mindset. Um, and I try really hard to switch my language into, huh, I don't, I haven't, I haven't learned that yet, or I don't get a chance to practice that, right? Um, so really, I'm really trying to change my self-talk to just give myself not only a break, but an opportunity to, to see where I can grow. Um, so that's, that's what I'm living by right now. Oh, huh, I don't get to practice that much yet <laughs> or now, right? No, but How could I practice it. that more? Practice, so practice, maybe it's practice is the word that I'm living by right now. Yeah. Uh, um, and anything, anything, cool. anything we want to grow into or get better at, and we do it through practice, just daily, small practice yeah and that's the consistency right we we teach and we coach so that aligns very mm -hmm. well with uh, what we want the organizations to do to be consistent and mm -hmm. practice the habit of um in a really be what they are preaching to be now this is fantastic yeah. thank you so much monica i'll not take any more of your time you. um and i i know for sure that this will be a very inspiring conversation for those who are uh, listening to this Thank you so much. Good luck with you know you. your Thank future you. activities and endeavors. And, and um, you know, I, I wish to talk to you soon again. Thank you so much, Ronika.